Welcome and thanks for joining us for today's webinar, How the New Normal Could Improve Your IT Operations. I'm Mark Smith on the Government Marketing Team and I'm kicking off today's event. We'll get started in a moment, but first let's cover a few housekeeping items. The webcast is being recorded and will be sent out in a few days along with the slides. Phones are muted and participants are encouraged to type questions into the Q&A tab on the right side of your screen. Our speaker today is Arthur Bradway from the Government Sales Engineering Team. He's covering the slides demo and Q&A today. Arthur, please take it from here. All right, so hopefully everybody can hear me. Um, and uh, thanks for being here. Uh, like Mark said, my name is Arthur Bradway. I'm one of the sales engineers on the federal team. But I also help out with the state, local, and education side too. So uh, I get around. And like Mark said, this should be this is being recorded, so you'll get a link to this later. And like you said, there's a chat window on the right hand side of the window. Uh, go ahead and ask questions in there. If we get to it towards the end, we'll answer the questions. Then um, there's a lot we're going to cover, so we may run out of time. And if there's anything that didn't get answered, we'll follow up. Uh, post webinar with uh, some questions or answers for you guys. So with that said, actually I should have probably advanced the slide. Like I said, I'm Arthur. <laughs> um, so today the agenda for the most part is challenges and everything we're getting faced with today for improving IT and kind of overcoming some obstacles. And I think everybody would say if you've been in the IT space long enough, um, it's always changing, <laughs> but I think the last few months we've seen things change at a dramatically warp speed pace um, with everybody moving to that work from home environment and some of the stuff that that got faced there and uh, having to ad quickly adapt to some new business needs. Um, so I'm going to assume everybody sort of faced some of the same thing and uh, over the last few months and that's probably causing people to go and look at some of the software they're already using or reevaluating some of the software they're using because they just started realizing they've got dozens or maybe hundreds of couple people I've talked to different modern tools out there that are doing sometimes the same thing but none of them are communicating together or sharing any of that information so it's been a little bit difficult for people so that's where they're starting to talk about some of the obstacles they've had. Too many tools, not be able to share information, not getting some stuff automated, not seeing visibility into the whole the whole space or their whole environment because they're those silo tools. So trying to look for ways to make the IT oper operations team be a little bit more successful and adapt to their needs, uh, hopefully at the same pace. So. I think the challenges sort of started saying them there a minute ago, but um, everything's changing. And with this change lately, uh, I'm going to, again, this is another one I'm going to assume people are going to say yes to if I ask, just because it's been seem like the reaffirm theme for the last three, four months on demos is one of the changes they've had to deal with this year is you guys probably had a, a, a top 10 thing, a top 10 list you guys are going to work on this year. And Everything was looking great in January and February, and then March and April hit, and those top 10 priorities probably dropped to the bottom of the list, and suddenly there were three new ones at the top of the list, and that was all support, support uh, supporting those remote users or getting hardware set up to support, support the remote users, or how do we actually work with those remote users and a bunch of other things along that line, right? So that led to one of the problems with the budgets. So just because those top 10 items on your list kind of disappeared for a while. They're still on the list, but to probably pay for those new uh, priorities for all the remote users, I'm going to guess people robbed from Paul to pay Peter. Uh, so they took money away from all those other budgets and reallocated some money for these new thing, new projects. And now they're being told to do more with less and they don't have money to do this. So they're trying to figure out what they can do and that's led to a lot of the consolidation talk. Um, depending on who I talk to uh, and how big they are for an organization and everything or how distributed they are, I've had people tell me that what, they've gone back and looked and they might have two dozen, three dozen, four dozen different tools or products out there that do some sort of monitoring. Um, 
a couple of people I've talked to, some really large agencies and stuff, uh, you know, that are nationwide and everything, they've sat down and they've come back to us and told us they had over 100 products that they were doing modern with. I think right now my top one is they had, oh God, what was it, 148 or 149. So might as well round it up and say 150. But when they looked across their whole agency and looked every office when they did a survey and they started asking people, I think it was a I think it was 148 tools they had across the network, and they suddenly realized that was a lot. So why do we have a dozen tools that were doing some sort of network monitoring? Why do we have a dozen tools that maybe were doing application monitor? Why do we have a half dozen tools doing databases? And all these were siloed off. Nobody was sharing data. So they weren't really getting a lot of use out of it. Or they were getting use out of it, but it wasn't the best of use out of it. Because now that they were finding out they were having to reduce some budgets or consolidate some stuff, save money, they were like, we're paying for 12 of these networking tools. Can we get away with one of them and save all that money and use it for something else? So that's led to a lot of conversations with us lately around um, can you replace some existing tools? How do you guys share data? How do you do this? How do you do that inside the products? So that's been a big topic of conversation the last few months with us. Um, complexity, interesting. I noticed, I'm not sure if you guys, there should be an icon in there under complexity. I just noticed it's not shown on my slide, but um, the complexity piece has come into play too, right? Um, if you ask your end users if it's getting easier to do their jobs today, I'm going to say they're probably going to say yes. I mean, think about it. With all the new technology we've added over the last three, four, five, six, seven years, as long as I got an internet connection, I can kind of do my job no matter where I am. Um, I, you know, most of the stuff I run are all web-based applications, either something back in our corporate network where I can VPN into it and run it, or it's a SaaS solution where as long as I get connectivity, I can get to it. So from the end user's perspective, that's gotten really easy and Kind of enjoyable to some extent if you can say working from home working from home to me is the enjoyable part right if you turn around and ask that same question to the IT guys if it's gotten easier for you to do the jobs I think they're gonna give you a mixed answer they're gonna say yeah and one way it's gotten a lot easier with all the new technology it's kind of easier to get some things up and running um, you know, I remember back to the days of having to run coax cables and dip switches and IRQ interrupts and all this stuff that you had to configure to get things working. And now a lot of, you know, semi plug and play type of thing to get stuff going. So, you know, it's easier to get the stuff, but that making things easier has also come with the trade off of it's a lot more complex, um, to make those systems run. You know, going back, I was thinking, you know, I've been around for a little bit. I remember back when it was like, you know, everything was on a mainframe. So as long as that, that computer was sitting in the corner and the lights were on, uh, you knew everything was working. And then we started going away from the mainframe down into the physical servers. And suddenly we had a room full of those servers. And then we started getting into the virtualization. And now we had some big servers with hundreds or thousands of works, uh, virtualized environments in there. Then we started moving into the containers, and now we're starting to get into that software-defined everything type of space, and the converged technologies, and there's the stuff that we still got on-prem, the stuff we've got in the cloud that we host our own, the SaaS offerings. Suddenly, there's a lot out there that we're having to keep track of and monitor. It did make everybody's lives a little bit easier to do stuff, but that complexity had added a lot in there. And then... Needless to say, with all that complexity and new stuff out there, there are new threats. So that adds into the, the challenge of the environment. Oh, there's the complexity. It was a slide that moved up. So that big ball of yarn or string there. Sorry. So I kind of already said a little bit of this. You know, everybody was like trying to figure out what was needed to deliver on this, this monitoring solution because now – Maybe 10 years ago, 15 years ago, hell, maybe even five, six, seven years ago, the network was the key, right? That was, everything was based around did we have the network connectivity. And now with all the stuff being application-based and SaaS and hosted and everything, kind of the applications are becoming the king of the world today, uh, it seems like. 
Um, those applications or software can be stuff that is packaged off the shelf commercial stuff, you know, like you bought Orion from SolarWinds. So that's something you bought, you installed it, it gets updated once or twice a year or something like that. It could be some custom application that you built or some third party application that somebody built for you. Or it could be um, a custom app that's on a SaaS solution that you're using. And the stuff that you're using, the package or your custom apps could be deployed on prem or up in the cloud. So it could be all over the place, right? That's some of the complexity. And then those applications may have multiple dependencies across the, say, the IT stack. Uh, that app is probably using a database, which is probably on another server. It's got the operating system in there. There be, might be some middleware in there that's run in. There's some storage at the back end, maybe on other servers with other applications, depending on how the application is set up. And then, of course, we still have all that network components underneath it to connect everything, right? So um, any kind of a failure somewhere along that line or some issue popping up, that could have an impact on that service delivery, right, or that product that we're trying to deliver there. And as soon as one of those things start having some slow performance or an impact, that's usually going to cause people to start picking up the phone and making phone calls. Because a lot of the times there's money associated with that, um, depending on what type of business you're in. And it's, to me, it's all money, but it's dependent on, you know, is it, it's, is it like you're a retail store where your, your website went down and people can't get online and place orders type of a thing? Or is it your, um, use a service desk, for example, since we're going to talk about service desk again. Maybe I use a SaaS service desk and that went down, right? That would be impacting my service to my end users, which would start getting them upset with me and start theoretically costing money, right? So it, it's all subjective, but it's whatever the revenue is and how people are making things work, right? So anything can impact the, the security, the compliance of that application and the delivery of that. So that has started at people ask a lot of questions. Are we able to monitor all those different layers of that stack? Can we see the relation, the, the data? Can we correlate that data together? And this is where all those siloed solutions that everybody's starting to realize they've got are starting to fall apart for them because they can't, they can't share the data. Um, are you able to map some of the dependencies between the layers, uh, the different pieces? and be able to help identify where that real problem is and start fixing things faster. Um, can you see the logs from all those various devices? Can you see the configuration changes across those devices? Did any of those configuration changes maybe lead to the impact that you're seeing in the, the, the service delivery right now? Um, are there any overlapping of the tools right this second? Or are they all being purchased in this little silo? Um, are you paying, you know, I see some people paying a premium for some tools, um, but the budgets have changed, so they're being told to do more with less, so they're all looking maybe if there's an alternative out there. So how do we help address some of this stuff? So I'm going to say let's stop sharing for a minute and go in and show some demos. And hopefully... I should I don't think my browsers have timed out. Give me a half a second. Let me go in and refresh. Uh, they did. Darn it. Uh, that was quick. I thought I totally all these browsers have refreshed just before I uh, started the demo. So uh, give me a half a second. I'm going to refresh all these windows and see if they'll actually. Nope, they're not going to log it. They're going to. I'm going to force to log in. So. One of the ones that everybody's starting to key in on is visualization of the stuff, right? So one of the key things in Orion is the mapping. So I'm going to show a few examples of the maps. Um, this has been in the Orion product for a little bit, uh, probably last year or two. We just had a big update that allowed you to start making these things a little bit more the aesthetic, aesthetically pleasing stuff, adding some colors in, new icons, text labels, and stuff like that. So the basic functionality is there. Some of the stuff that may look different from your guys' map, maybe because this is brand new. Uh, this 2020.2 release has been out three weeks, four weeks now. I uh, can't remember the exact date, but it's reasonably new. Um, so, but this was a good example of how we can show a relationship between the data and do some visualization here. So like this is like this map says, this is like a, an Azure uh, SharePoint hybrid site. So we've got some stuff up in the cloud, right? On up on Azure, we got some servers, we got some applications out there and everything that we're monitoring. 
but we also got connectivity down to the on-prem solution because we've got some servers and SharePoint and stuff running down here too. And you can see there's these network connections along the way. So be able to see this, you can suddenly, you know, if there's a problem, hey, we can't maybe, we're having a problem getting out to the, um, some service issues with the Azure side. Well, there could be a connectivity issue back here where we're seeing it. Or the on-prem stuff, we're having a problem, it looks like here with the database on one of these servers. So be able to quickly see from a, a high-level map view that maybe I've got on a NOC or a SOC display, being able to drill in and see what the issue is is a great deal. So this guy's getting a lot of high memory usage right this second. So I could hover over him and see what it was. And if I need to, I can right click and or click on him and drill into those node details. So that's one example. Um, come on guys. This was another one. This was like a little exchange environment. Yeah, while we're talking while I'm waiting for that, I'm gonna let these go. So that was an exchange environment that I've got over on this other page. I'm going to just get these going in the background for us for a second. Sorry about that. Um, this one was great. This is all more of an on-prem solution, but this is showing the whole layout. We've got some Hyper-V stuff in here. We've got some data storage. we got some uh, physical servers out there doing some stuff. These apps that we're monitoring from the mailboxes. And what I like on this one, because this is actually showing a handful of things. This is... Uh, the server and application monitoring piece. This is the, the virtualization monitoring piece. This is actually looking at the storage arrays too and showing all the connections and relationships between these guys. Um, I kind of like this one just when I'm talking to people because, you know, out here we've got some pure storage devices. So when people ask about storage, I'm always curious of which storage do they mean? Um, like this map is great because it's got the pure storage devices. So is it the one, the array level? There's also the data store from the virtualization side, and then there's the actual local storage. What's the CND drive look like? Because every tool is going to look at a slightly different, right? Server and application monitor is going to look at something to say, hey, how's the operating system running? How, is this, how, is, how does the operating system see itself working? What's the memory, disk, CPU, stuff like that storage, right? The virtual center or virtual machines are, are VMAN, virtualization manager, is going to be saying, hey, how are the hosting guests working? How's the storage from my perspective? And then the storage array is going to be going, hey, here's the storage array. Here's all my LUN. Here's all my disk. How are they performing from their perspective? So be able to see a little bit of this all tied up together in the map because, you know, hey, maybe this maybe somebody's saying there's a problem with the server, and we look there, and everything's great, but we see down the line there's some issues happening. So give me a – starts pinpointing the issues a little bit faster. Um, this one's a good example too. Um, this is from our server and application monitoring. This is for our, something we call application insight or app insight. And we've got some for SQL, IIS, Active Directory and Exchange. I'm going to make this page just a little bit smaller for a minute and then I'm going to zoom back in for everybody. So the, you know, this is just a kind of a template on some, uh, souped up template to go out and collect a bunch of information from IIS. So we can see, hey, the sites that are running, application pools, connections that are coming through, the ASP.NET, uh, the cache, uh, average memory and usage and stuff like that. But this is where some of the other integration starts to pop into play too. So right here, we've got another tool, Database Performance Analyzer. So DPA does wait time analysis for the lack of a better word. Um, the um, the, mo the server application monitoring side, I think, is the help side of a server, right? Um, hey, is the server that's hosting SQL Server or whatever database, uh, database, is it running? How's the CPU? How's the memory? How's the disk space? Is SQL Server up and running? Does it have memory and all that stuff? So kind of the health of the server, the health of the application, but everything being all, a lot of these applications are database-driven, data-driven tools. I need to be looking at the databases too to see how are the queries running. And if I'm asking a, a question of database, um, I'm in Herndon, Virginia. So if I said, how many customers do I have in Virginia? How long did that query, that was the question I asked the database. How long did it take me to get a response back and why was it slow? Uh, what was the wait time? Was it a bad query, a table that needs to be updated, an index or something else along that line? So I can start getting visibility into 
this uh, IIS database via the database uh, uh, database performance analyzer. Um, there's another piece in server and application monitor called application dependencies. This is something where you install the client on a machine, and it basically starts looking at the uh, like the net stat information to start seeing the processes and the ports that are being used. And we start looking for latency and packet loss across those lines. And we'll show that, I think, in the next map, uh, the map after that. Um, one other thing I want to mention here is we also have this thing called AppStack. Now, this isn't a product. It's just a way to visualize uh, the data that we're already collecting. So what AppStack is, is it takes um, the data collected from server and application monitor, the virtualization manager, the database side, uh, storage resource monitor, our web performance monitor, and it shows how all those things are related together and builds this app stack. And I would call this one the mini app stack. This is the app stack for just this IIS server we're looking at. So it's this application using this database. Transactions are what web performance monitor is. So we've got a couple of transactions looking at the web the website. These are just the various servers that's running on. Uh, these are virtualized, so there's a host, the data store, there's volumes associated with LUNs and pools. So if somebody comes up and says, hey, there's a problem with the website, is it just the application that's maybe having a problem? Or down here, we can see we're having some issues with the server and there's like 92% of memory being used. Uh, there's actually a couple things that looks like it's going on here. So this starts helping us figure out where do we need to go and look and what do we need to take it, uh, start doing investigations on. The other one that's kind of nice in here, uh, this is getting into um, uh, some of those other things that we're monitoring from the IIS perspective. This also has a small tie-in here. We've got, uh, we're going to talk about this in a few minutes, uh, some application performance monitoring. So this is a hosted service. It's a, a SaaS solution called AppDoptics. This actually will start tying in a little bit with AppDoptics right here to start showing some information too. So a ton of the stuff that's correlating the data together, right? Then over here, um, actually, let's go to PerfStack. So we're showing the, actually, this is the one I probably should have shown. When I was talking about application dependency, sorry, I put these in the wrong order. Um, where I was saying, hey, we're looking at those, those processes uh, and serve, uh, processes to see what ports and stuff are using. These are these application dependencies. So down here is where you can start seeing that latency and packet loss between the the applications between these two services and stuff. Another way, and this is probably one of my favorite things in the tool, is for visualization of the data and help doing the troubleshooting. It's something we call performance analyzer or a perf stack. So for all the people that are Windows guys and even the Linux people out there, you're all probably used to opening up something like um, Task Manager on a Windows box or Top on Linux to see like memory, CPU, disk space, or the network card information, what processes are running, and try to do some troubleshooting. Think of the performance analyzer as sort of like task manager. And what you can do is take the various components that we're monitoring and drag them into this stack. So this one's for one of the hybrid uh, pieces for the front end. So this is looking at Microsoft uh, IIS availability, uh, current connections, uh, anonymous users, non-anonymous users, some um, wait time stuff that's coming from the database performance analyzer, uh, read-write output on the disk for demo of the database, um, some disk queues here, and we're starting to look at some of the data center stuff. In any events, um, configurations we'll talk about in a minute, any alerts, some SQL Server, read IOPS, CPU across multiple machines. So what you can do is drag and drop in metrics here and then the cool thing is you can save this as a project. Can't do it in a demo, but I can save this as Arthur's project. And then pretty much I basically share this URL with people on my database team, my server team, my application team, the network team, and we're all looking at the same data. All that data is correlated together. And I can come in here and say, hey, I want to look at it for the last 12 hours, last five days, whatever it is, and use this to help me do some troubleshooting. And the cool thing is it's correlating this data together. Now, if you guys haven't seen a perf stack before, um, this is a whole other demo, but I'm going to just go in here for a second. What you can do is go over to the performance analyzer. And this one's got a small project in it. So this is just said, hey, there's a node here, and we added in the CPU response time and a couple things. 
I can come over here and if I said, hey, I want to know about configuration changes, I can drag that up in here. So the server configuration monitor tells me about like hardware, software changes, things like that. But I also know there's other stuff related to this machine. So if I click the relationship icon here, this is going to show me, hey, we're actually got some storage associated with this. So you can come over here to a storage pool and uh, you can drag stuff into it. So pretty much if you're monitoring it, you can drag it, drop it over into here and save it as a template. So that's what performance perf stack is. And be able to correlate this data is the one that everybody's really getting into. If I'm at a trade show like Ignite or VMware World or something showing this off, I maybe I'm showing it to you at the booth. Other people start gathering around and see me show this. And when they when you leave, they walk up to the booth and the first question is, is what product is that and how much does it cost? And that's when I get to tell them it's it's not a product, it's part of Orion, so it's free. Um, but the more modules you have, the more data you can see, right? So that's a big piece of that one. Um, one that I that wasn't on the slide, but I think is worth mentioning here. This is part of the network performance monitoring, but this is a really nice one. There's this thing called NetPath. And this is where you can go in and say, hey, we've got stuff like we're going out and using some cloud offerings or solutions like Office 365 or Salesforce or NetSuite or something. Um, this could be going to stuff like um, YouTube or Amazon, too, if you wanted to. But this, you basically install a little probe on a machine. Uh, it's a Windows client. And it'll go out and try to connect to Office 365. And it basically starts to build you a, a visual trace route, for the lack of a better word. And what you start seeing is, hey, this is the probe that I put on maybe my in my office in Herndon or Dallas or something like that. And it's going out and trying to connect to Office 365. I'm going to zoom out a little bit. So I'm going to zoom back in for you guys, but watch how big this is. So the stuff on the left-hand side are the machines that we own to manage ourselves. So there's network performance on air, the network traffic analyzer, maybe the configuration monitor. Eventually, you're going to get out to unmonitored devices, the things out on the World Wide Web, the, the greater Internet, right? And you're going to hit this charter site. And, you know, you can see this little icon here. Let me zoom in. It's showing that there's, like, these little loops. There's multiple paths. And when I start expanding that, it's going to show me all the different ways we're getting to Office 365. And this gets a little hard to see now. But you can see there's dozens of different paths we're taking to get there. And even though we're not monitoring these, we can actually start seeing if there's latency and packet loss along the way. Um, so an example of that one would be, uh, let's go back one, because I don't want to spend a ton of time on this, but um, down here with like this NetSuite example, this one is going great here. So there's our path to NetSuite. Here's my internal network. We're bouncing around in the internal network. We get out here. And there is a big path to get out the NetSuite. But we had a problem over here. And we go hover over these guys or click on one. Now we can see we had a big old failure over here. And if I had just that, something like Network Performance Monitor, and so somebody called me up and said, hey, we're having a problem access to NetSuite or Salesforce or whatever it is, I would get a clue here, get alerted that there was a problem or a connectivity issue, right? But NPM would be telling me, oh, hey, we can't get past this point then you got to do some investigation. If you have something like configuration monitor from the network side, this will actually track network changes, and you can scroll through the list, and you're going to see things like um, down in here, somebody changed the IP route. So that caused the issue. So NetPath is a nice one. And where I really like kind of pulling these all together, um, especially from an office example, is another map and some stuff here. So we were at Microsoft Ignite. People were coming up and asking, can we monitor Office 365, which we can, but a lot of people didn't seem to know about it. So here's a bunch of stuff from Server and Application Monitor that's going out to look at services and components of my Office 365 environment. This is showing NetPath. Now, I can't embed all those maps in here because it would fill up the whole page. But what I can do is make a little widget so that if there's some latency or something goes down, I'm going to get alerted and I know to drill in, and then I can view the individual map. This is a map of my office environment. So let's make this one a little bit bigger in another window. So again, sort of like we were looking at before, um, here is, you know, my on-prem stuff. If I move my mouse around, come on, there we go. Here's how we're getting out from the, the you know, we're going from this box 
uh, it's got some uh, the Pure device, the LUN, going out to these local drives, going out to these servers, going through all these network devices to get out to our, our cloud service. And the mouse is just not letting me drag around right this second. What's going on? But it gets the cloud, and then here's a whole bunch of the stuff we're monitoring up in the cloud from maybe an API or actually an application we've got installed, uh, maybe an agent on one of the machines to collect some data to come back. But there it gives us a whole picture of that Office 365 environment. And then people had a few key metrics that they wanted to be tracking on the Office 365, so they created a perf stack. So this is a great example of maybe a custom page that you could easily build that would be on, again, that knock display like, hey, here's my database environment, here's my Active Directory environment, here's my Office environment. Whatever it was, you can create a page and customize it for you and just have this on a rotating display so that we can see it. So this is really nice. So that, like I said, that's kind of a combination of a lot of the stuff in Arrive, but this shows you how having a single tool that can kind of correlate that data, it's in a common database, and be able to show a relationship between it is valuable versus all those different silo tools. The other one we want to talk about um, is the hosted solutions. So we've got a product called AppOptics. So this is the application performance monitoring side, so the stuff you've got up in the cloud. And this will plug into a bunch of existing services that you've got up in the, uh, the, the cloud, so Apache, Azure, Docker, Nginx, uh, uh, MongoDB, MySQL, all that stuff. So there's a bunch of plugins. Um, you can add hosts on there. So the hosts are the actual machines. There's a client you can install, and then you're going to be able to see stuff like CPU and memory like that. And then there's the services that we can go out and monitor. So if I want to add a host, this will show you all the hosts that we can uh, look at. So uh, some Amazon, Linux boxes, Debian, CentOS, Red Hat, and Ubuntu, Windows, some Docker or Kubernetes stuff. So these are a little agent you install to get out there and start collecting that information. Um, the, the plugins, there's a bunch of those out there. There's actually a bunch on the community side too for uh, plugins for uh, getting some of this stuff there. And then services. So this is where you usually have to put some code on the web page. And this can work with things like uh, the Node.js, PHP, Python, Java, .NET. So you put this little snippet of code into the website and it will start grabbing a bunch of the application performance uh, instrumentation. So when you get all that data back, now we can start looking at stuff. And the one that this is reasonably new for this one, uh, we were just looking at the Orion maps, apt optics in their last update made stuff that looks a lot like the Orion maps. But this is my web services and the stuff I've gotten. So how are things related between my various web services and the different applications or processes and stuff that they're using out there, right? Uh, you guys know a lot of the website stuff, it's not a single service, there's microservices. So server A might be running the database, server B might be running the application, server C might be running a search engine, or who knows, right? So it's all these microservices out there that a lot of these applications are using in the modern day. So be able to see, is it the booking service, is it the database, is it this pricing service, or what piece out there that is having an issue? And be able to visualize that has been a big issue, for, uh, big deal for a lot of the people. Um, let's go back over this page. Um, this has got, um, like if I'm kind of curious about, uh, let's look at a dashboard actually, I kind of like that. So this is just kind of a dashboard view that I think a lot of people would like. So this is going to go out and grab some of the, like the key metrics for host, CPU, memory, disk, stuff like that. But then based on what we're monitoring out there, I can throw in other metrics on what's the load, uh, response times, the volumes, HTTP requests, things along that line. So the bunch of stuff I can throw into this dashboard that we, if I want to build something up for that. From the services side, which is probably where everybody's going to go in and start looking at something, if I go over to like my web tier, this is going to give me things like, oh, you know, response time, request rate, any error rates, utilization, things along that line. It'll actually start telling me, hey, there's some high request volumes or hey, we're spending a lot of time waiting on these services, so we can come back and look at this in a minute. But uh, I kind of wanted to show, you know, from the details, the response breakdown, response times, uh, error rates, uh, the top transactions that are going on, 
if this is spread across multiple hosts, which hosts are they, or is one of these having more uh, a more uh, longer response time than the others? So quick high level, uh, from the transaction side, what are the transactions that are taken on on this service? Uh, any remote services it's using, like it's also using the booking service, this post booking service, an authentication service. I don't know what the NetaSuite service is, but we can view charts and see what's going on there. You can drill, drill in and see traces on what's going on and start getting down to look at the individual level of these guys to see what's happening there. So this is kind of another, um, not a perf stack, but this is sort of what people relate it to. Now I can see start all the, the application stack for my web product. So uh, this web tier, the Ruby on Rails, this Faraday stuff, my HTTP request, the Java booking service, all the way down to the database, and I can see what's going on. And when I get into the database, this is actually collected information about the queries and stuff. You can look at the different code that's being profiled along the way. So things have been made there. And what's really nice from the web applications is when we detect some of these changes that are going on, we can actually inject a little bit of a, a, a snippet of code in there. There's like an ID that we can put in. So when this, if you've got something like uh, Logly, which is our, our uh, hosted or uh, cloud-based login service, you can actually have Logly collect the, uh, the logs from these devices. And that little code snippet that's getting injected into it, when I click search the logs, it knows that code snippet that we're looking for and it automatically injects into the log so I can start seeing, hey, here's this, this is that snippet, and here's all the logs that are associated with that event and what's going on. And I can start looking at it from a timeline to see what was going on. So actually going in and trying to look this information up in the logs got a hundred times easier. And I'm looking, I gotta start going a little bit faster here. Um, so this is the application performance side, being able to see all the visibility into that and the services and what's going on and get that visibility is a key thing there. And I think, give me a half a second, I think we want to go back to the slide deck after this one. Yep. So let me stop sharing for a second and get back over the slide deck because if I share it on my screen, it's not going to look as great. I want to share it inside the uh, the application. So go back over here. And now we're, let's do a quick little talk around security since we got like 20 minutes left. I knew I was going to run out of time today. Um, so we got all these different applications and services and network stuff going. That leaves us open for some threats or vulnerabilities out there, right? So we've got people, the you know, the traditional, uh, I guess I can call them traditional, uh, the, the ransomware, the malware, the phish and the trojan, the virus stuff out there on the network side, right? Uh, from a system side, it's, it is the viruses, the phish and the malware there too, USB sticks, things along that line. Um, the data breaches, and then protecting the data. So, you know, I think it's pretty clear a lot of people, uh, everybody seems to be getting attacked in some extent. Um, one of the way, biggest way breaches occur is poor patching. Um, so <coughs> having visibility into your patch environment is a big deal. And then a lot of the stuff involves internal actors. And this one I kind of think is, I won't say underreported, but I wonder if it's more. This is more figuring out if people have access or inappropriate access to file shares and uh, folders and stuff like that. So I wanted to go over to this one. So this is a uh, a survey we do every year um, that talks about what people are seeing. And <coughs> oops, excuse me, sorry guys. Um, this is, it, uh, I think I heard that when they send out this email, this will be attached to the, to the email. So you'll get this whole survey. Um, what you'll get here is, uh, this is really big. I can't remember how many pages it was, but what kind of, uh, we see people talking about how it's changed over the last years. Cause we've been doing this now for like five, six years. Um, you know, was it careless and untrained users? Was it foreign government stuff? Was it general hacking? Was it malicious insiders, uh, activists, industrial spies? And you can see, you know, how 
the careless and untrained users has sort of crept up from where it was originally. Interesting that it went down last year. Um, the foreign governments, uh, the general hacking is out there. So these are the ones everybody's seeing as a big, uh, a big issue to people. And then the effectiveness of their tools. Um, you know, are they using a tool? Do they not see a lot of impact from it, moderate or high level? So, you know, are they looking at endpoint security software, identity access tools, patch management, password tools, NAC solutions, web security, vulnerability management? So just kind of interesting to see what people are using out there and what they're seeing effective and the number of people that aren't using uh, different pieces of the software or different tools out there. So the security survey is pretty good. I wouldn't be surprised if we do another one, so maybe everybody can keep an eye out for that. Um, the, the threats from today sort of require a layered approach. I think most people probably know this, you know, there's the application side, there's data protection, there's the infrastructure, the network side. So, you know, patching and antivirus, I think, is the ones that first come to everybody's attention. Um, the network side, we got the firewalls, the DMZs, uh, VPNs, intrusion detection, all that type of stuff. On the data stuff, there's encryption and file integrity monitoring. On the application side, there's even as the, the code secure and all that stuff, right? So places that we see we are able to help out with people is patch management. Um, and again, I'm not sure how much time we're going to have to show every one of these, um, but the patch management tool, it's not a standalone patch tool. It sits on top of SUS or System Center, and it really helps with third-party patches. So something like w, uh, Windows Update Server or WSUS and System Center, they're great at Microsoft patches, but they don't do anything else unless you build them. Well, in System Center, you can build your own patches. In SUS, you can. Uh, what our patch tool does is it provides uh, updates for things like Java and Firefox and Chrome that you can inject into SUS and in System Center. So it'll give you patching capability across those third-party patches. Um, the threat detection response, that's our SEM tool or security event manager. So, hey, you know, best practices, I think, just say you got to be collecting all those logs. you got to be monitoring them. If some event is detected, I need to get alerted about it. And if possible, can I take an action on that? and do something. So with the security event manager, you can see if um, some process you don't want to run is running and kill it, if, uh, block USB devices from being plugged in, <coughs> see if people are creating new user accounts or changing passwords, or maybe I love it looking at it to see if people are cleaning up, uh, clearing logs off the system. Because one of the things the bad guy's got to do is try to clear up the logs after himself, so I get an alert that if anybody clears out like the system log or the Windows log files. Access rights management is probably one of the biggest ones we're getting right now. This is our ARM tool. So this will be able to show you who has access to the file folder, what, where, who, how, all that type of stuff. And then the configuration management, this is be able to detect changes on like the network and system side. And now we're gonna jump back into another quick demo because I've got like 15 minutes. So we're gonna jam here. Get back in and let's take a look at, since this, the login event manager is the first thing on the screen, we're gonna go and do this. So this is the security event manager or our SEM tool. Pretty much if you can send syslog over to this thing, it'll inject it and show you the events or things like Windows and maybe a Linux box or something. If it can't do the syslog, you can install an agent on the machine. The agent will take the Windows logs, convert them over to syslog so we can see it and send all that stuff over here, and then you can start seeing like login failures or log on uh, uh, failed logins, um, rules that are getting fired. You know, here's all the machines that I've got in here. These are all the events that are coming in. And what you can do is we've got some pre-canned ones for things like uh, services stopping and starting or something like that or some system events. But you can come down in here and create all of your own events so I do a lot of Active Directory demos. So if I was on my home environment, um, if I went, I get a PowerShell script that creates a whole bunch of users, accounts, groups, and everything, it deletes them. And it just shows this whole thing being populated, a new user getting added, deleted, changed to a group, deleted from a group, modifying a group, resetting their password, clearing the logs, all that stuff. So I've got my own set of uh, tabs down here or events that I want to get alerted on. So it'll show us the details of what came in, 
you know, we can go and look at the historical data to see how much it's been happening over time. You can see this looks a lot like uh, the uh, the perf stack to some extent. We're starting to see some of the make the some of the views look familiar when you're looking at stuff. This is a little bit more um, up and down versus the cross side, but that kind of a histogram look. But I think everybody can relate to it. Um, you can create roles that if you see somebody logging in a certain number of times and their failed logins, maybe you lock out their account. So that's the active response stuff. So this is just a quick little overview of that. The other one, like I said, the probably the biggest one I'm talking about lately is Access Rights Manager. Um, so this one lets you go in and see who has access where to stuff. Um, this is one of the biggest ones. So you can come in, say, I want to see who has access to these file shares or servers or groups and stuff, right? Um, just for time, I've already got that saved and run on the desktop. <laughs> It only takes a couple minutes to run, but since we're pressed for time. So this is cool because now it went in. I'm going to zoom in on this for just a minute because it's kind of hard to see. But over here on the right-hand side, you're going to have columns that say, hey, these guys have got full control, modify, read, execute. And as permissions get added, this will start expanding, right? So you'll see there's more permissions down here when they start getting out. But what's cool in here is now I said, show me for those uh, file shares or those those folders, right? Well, on the organizational one, the, the domain admins and the NT account has it. But then these are the people that might be part of this account or the users that are part of it or users that have directly assigned permissions. So from an auditor's perspective, you run this report, you throw it over a wall to them, you get an email to them, and they're happy from an audit side. You guys with the day-to-day -day usage, you're going to sit in the tool to say, hey, I want to go out and look at the sales folder, who's got permissions there. So here's the NTFS permissions, who's got full control, who's got list control, uh, view, modify, restrictive. And when you click into these guys, um, you're going to actually start seeing who the users are that are part of those groups. So here is this guy. He's And what's interesting is they've got permissions two different ways to get in here. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? If I wanted to see more about that guy, I could drill in here and say, show me their accounts view. And I love this because now I can see this user and he's part of all these other groups and I can just start expanding this and visually see how, what they've got for data or permissions, what groups they belong to, where they can get to, um, and really get a lot of data. I love this. Um, the other one, like this one guy over here, I've actually got an alert set if anybody changes the permissions on the sales folder. One of the really great things is you can make changes through the Access Rights Manager. Anything that gets changed via the Access Rights Manager, you have to put a, a reason in there. So like if I go over to permissions, I'm going to just pretend for a second. I'm going to grab Bob and put him in this folder and say, hey, I want him to have modify. If I go and say apply, like create that permission, I'm forced to put an explanation on why I'm doing it because I want to. And what this will do is this went out and did a few things. It said, hey, Arthur, you want to give Bob permission to this folder. So I went out to see if there's anybody that already had permission to that folder. And if not, it'll say, hey, we're going to create a new group. We're going to give these permissions, and we're going to give Bob. Uh, Bob will be added to the group. And now I got the, the reason why I did it. And then I can go and schedule this or save it to run. What's great is now all of that stuff that I put in for the reason why, it gets put in something we call the logbook. So if you look up here, there's a logbook for this activity. Whoops, and here's everything that we've done on this device, or sorry, on that share, right? If I bounce back over here to that resources view, you'll see, look, there's a logbook for this user, so I can see what members I made them up, that I got them to new groups, membership list, access rights and everything. I can also go over to these folders and we see when permissions got changed, groups got added. So a lot of stuff you can collect from the Access Rights Manager side. And again, there's way more to get into this one than we can do here. Um, I'm just looking at my time and we got like nine minutes left, so I'm going to kind of wrap up that one. Uh, the one I did want to mention briefly, uh, we sort of highlighted it over here when we were looking at the perf stack. Um, the, the Network Configuration Manager, from a compliance side, especially on the federal DOD space, We've got some built-in comp compliance templates that'll go out and look at like DISA, FISMA, STIG compliance and come back and show you where things fail. 
a simple one to look at is this HIPAA security, just for time's sake. So this did two simple checks. Is the community stream set to public and is encryption uh, enabled for the password? And you can say if it's a pass, warning, or a fail. And if it fails or a warning, I can actually drill into here. It found community stream was public, and it'll tell me and show me where it is. So it was on line 195. I can drill in here and actually see that. So being able to do these compliance checks are great. And then, whoops, got too many windows open. I shouldn't have closed that one on it. But what's even nicer is that compliance check that went out and said, see if public is there. I could actually modify that to say, change public to Arthur's secret password if I wanted to. I need to write the script that does it, but I can change those permissions. There's also some this vulnerability stuff that we can go out. This is in a scanner, but this looks at the iOS version for the Cisco devices in a Juniper version. And it'll tell you if there's any vulnerabilities detected for that iOS. On the server side, there's um, hardware software changes and things along that, um, which can show up and flag you because this is a great thing to know about. Um, I got to get back into the other side for a second. So let's stop sharing this and go back to the slide deck uh, just so we can go wrap it up. Although the good thing is I don't see any questions in there. So hopefully that means hopefully nobody's falling asleep on me. Um, the last section is kind of some IT service management. Um, you know, one of the things we've got is we've got a couple different uh, ticketing solutions or help desk solutions for people. There's a SaaS cloud-based solution out there that really is the full um, ITIL ready solution out there. That's called SolarWinds Service Desk. So this one's got this, uh, you know, uh, the incident problem, incident response, problem, change, release management type of stuff. Um, there's a catalog for your workflows in the forums, really customizable, role-based access for, for permissions. Um, there's a REST API that you can do some integration in there. It does inventory and asset management. This is that full, like I said, an ITIL solution for you. Um, this one, literally, even a high-level overview of this would take, an hour or more, and if we got into the details, it could be a day or two. So uh, this is one for a follow-up webinar later. Um, there's some um, integration in there. So the, between the Orion side and the Solon Service Desk, alerts can be sent to the Service Desk, have it create events or trigger like uh, tickets and um, report those IDs back to the, the Solon side. The inventory discovery and stuff could tie in and push data into the service desk. Um, you know, the big one on this one is, um, you know, response time and resolution. I opened up a ticket. How fast did I get a response to it? And then how fast did we re re uh, get it resolved? Um, so those are kind of the, the big one on that side. And like I said, that's a whole other webinar for us, but I wanted to mention it here real quick. Um, that one's the cloud-based solution. We get a lot of people that have, uh, depend on who's on this what, this call, we get a lot, of, do a lot with the government side, right? So a lot of these guys have air-gapped um, secure networks. So those uh, hosted services don't really work for them. So we do have some on-prem solutions for that. Um, Web Help Desk, it's not a full, it, it's a ticketed it's a, a ticketed solution. It's not the full blown ITIL service incident change service catalog type of thing. That's more of the people that just need to I need to track tickets. I need to know when they got opened, how long they were open, what we did to resolve them, and be able to just report on all of that stuff and track it. Um, for the remote user support, I just realized there should have been one on the last slide that we didn't talk about. It wasn't there, but now that I think about it. So for on-prem, we've got Daneware Remote Control or Daneware Remote Support. This allows me to remote into my users' machines, make some changes, help them out with some stuff. Um, maybe behind the scenes, I can stop and start some services while interrupting them while they're doing their work, it, work and everything. So that's really good. There's actually a hosted solution or a cloud-based solution called Daneware Remote Everywhere that for the people that are looking for that internet-based solution, they can use. It has a lot of the same functionality that Daneware or Mini Remote Control and Remote Support has, except it's a cloud-based solution. It has a couple other features in it too, but they're kind of comparable. Um, just depends on whether or not you've got that on-prem or cloud solution you're looking for. Um, and kind of to wrap it up, um, you know, I think this is the, the, we're trying to do everything sort of all IT. When I go and talk to people, a lot of times they think of SolarWinds as just a networking company. 
And you know, that's fair. When we started 20 odd years ago uh, or 20 years ago, we did do network and the guys that founded the company were network people and they created all these little tools to do their job and started selling them online. And a lot of that stuff as networks got bigger, larger, and people started to go from managing a handful of machines to dozens or hundreds or thousands of devices. And they needed to keep data instead of a day or a few hours or a day or two. And they started to need to keep it for weeks or months or years. A lot of those standalone tools morphed into what Orion is today. So they still think of us as a network company because that was our bread and butter. But I think you can see from what we're showing today, we've got a ton of stuff that covers the application side, the so database side, the infrastructure stuff, along with the network inside. Wrapped around all of those things is the security stuff, right? And then depending on who the job or the person is, they're going to be looking at different data. They may need the same type of data, but they're going to look at it from a different perspective. On top of all that is the service management side. And, you know, we want to be able to help you wherever that that technology is, wherever the IT is. Is it on-prem? Is it in a private cloud or a public cloud? Be able to help you fill those gaps or fill give you a solution for all those environments. Um, you know, so this is our, you know, you can, a lot of the stuff you can run standalone or have it integrated. So the network tools, the system tools, the database tools, the service management side. Um, for people that, this one isn't a build up note, okay. Um, there's a bunch of different places to go for more information. So uh, we got the Solar One Success Center. Um, this is like the, our customer portal. So um, there's a lot of people, when I go and show this, they ask for a lot of training. If you guys don't know, if you got, find out whoever your main uh, Orion administrator is, they should have access to the customer portal. They can create accounts for you, and there's a ton of training resources in there in the virtual classrooms. So I would say go in there and look. The Success Center has got thousands of articles, tens of thousands of articles on um, troubleshooting and things like that and knowledge-based type of stuff. For people that maybe want to add new features or functions or something to the product or looking to buy stuff new, we've got these smart start programs to help people get products up and running. Obviously, there's tech support that's available. Um, I would point to people a lot to the THWAC community. That's our online site. That's where all the users go and share information. When I can't find an answer, I always go to, well, actually, THWAC's the first place I got to look for everything because usually somebody up there has asked it. Um, there's a SolarWinds Academy for people that are looking to maybe get certified and stuff in SolarWinds, and that's some of the virtual classrooms. Um, we've got a page up on how SolarWinds helps people with some of the COVID-19 stuff and how they're using the IT for that side. Um, Q&A. Um, nope. Uh, doesn't look like there is. There w I know at least one guy is paying attention because he said uh, he didn't have any questions, so I appreciate that. I, I figure the presentation was so boring you guys all fell asleep or the presentation was so good you guys are all riveted and hanging on every word and there were just no questions that popped up. And since I have an ego, I'm going to assume it's uh, the, the no questions and you were hanging on every word. Um, but if you have any questions, we're literally almost out of time. So um, the net, there's contact here for your government side and the federal ones or an educational. This will go into like a generic mailbox and get routed to the right people for you. So send questions there if you've got them. I uh, want to say thanks. And um, here's some other ways to contact us. So the, you're going to get all this. And then the one line, one last mention before we hang up is we know people can't trap. Well, Right now, nobody can travel, right? But usually telling everybody to take some time out for two or three days, travel to Texas, come to some virtual conference, and uh, get the money for the airfare, hotel, and all that stuff is usually not a good way uh, to do it. Budgets are tight. People can't travel. So we've always had this thing called THWAC Camp. So THWAC Camp 2020 is coming out in the middle of November. Registration opens up on the 1st. This is two days, I think, right now. And it's going to be a packed, uh, packed thing of events. There's usually some federal um, specific uh, verticals. I haven't seen the agenda yet since the registration isn't open, but keep an eye out for that. And with that, I think I went a few seconds over. So I want to say thanks for everybody.